Here we go. All right, we're glad to have everybody here for our healing school class. So thank you guys for coming. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful grace, even the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your presence and your blessing. We approach your word humbly and reverently. We ask you to minister to our hearts, Father, tonight, the word of God. Help us to see what we haven't seen before. Help us to be established in what we have seen before. Help us to know the truth, even as you said in John chapter 8, and the truth will make us keep us free. We thank you that, Father, we are hastening ourselves to understand more about you and your word, and we respect it, we reverence it, and we ask you, Lord, to just enlighten us, bless us, comfort us, help us in the areas where we have struggles in our own personal Christian walk, and strengthen us and help us to be thankful in the areas that we've arrived and we have progressed and we have matured. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we started last week by looking at the diagnosis of faith. The diagnosis of faith, and you have your notes. So we'll look at that again. But this whole study is what I call the skeletal look of what faith is. If you had to do an x-ray of faith, what's, up, what's the skeletal form of faith behind that? Because the word faith, people always have all kinds of definitions and descriptions and confusion. And if we understand it, I think it will be a lot better. I said to you guys last week, and I'll say it again because it helps as a precursor, is that faith is the legal tender in the spirit realm. Because we've had people that say, well, why do I need faith? Well, that's the reason. It's like in our country, you need the dollars to be able to exchange for goods and services. Without the dollar, which is the legal tender in our country, and in any country money is, you can't get any goods and services, no matter how well meaning you are. <laughs> you gotta exchange some money for the value of whatever goods and services you get. So faith is the legal tender in the realm of the spirit. Let's look at least at least in two verses to help us remind us of why that is the case. Look at James chapter one. The Epistle of James, chapter 1 in the New Testament. Hallelujah. And in James chapter 1, I'll give you a moment to get there. James chapter 1, we're going to start looking at uh, verse 5. James chapter 1, verse 5, and then verse 6, and then verse 7. James chapter 1, the letter, verse five, six, and seven. Now I'll start reading. If any of you, well, any of you is who? He's talking about the whole church. This letter was the general epistle of James to all the churches that in the early days. If any of you lack in wisdom, so there's a need here, let him or her ask of God. So that's a petition. Now notice, you can ask of God, and He gives to all men liberally. Well, I like that. So God's not going to be stingy. He's not going to want to withhold. The idea that people say, well, sometimes you ask, and God says yes. And sometimes you ask, and God says no. And sometimes you ask, and God says maybe. They say that because they're thinking humanly. But there's no scripture to that. No scripture that says sometimes you ask and God says yes, sometimes you ask and he says no, and sometimes you ask and he says maybe. There's no scripture to that. Actually, that is actually false. Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, It's out of the lips of the Lord, ask and you shall receive. He didn't say ask and maybe, or God will say yes, or say no, or say maybe. He said, No, ask and you shall receive. That's so definite. Then he says, seek and you shall find. That's also definite. And then he said, knock and the door will be opened unto you. Not maybe, not if he likes you well enough, not if you're pleasing enough, not if he's happy with you, not if God was awake. No, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Ask and you shall receive. And in case, 
we make a mistake about not really understanding that in verse 11 of that same chapter, Matthew 7, that was verse 7. You go down to verse 11, he even emphasizes that. But actually, if you just look at that verse 7 again and go into verse 8. He said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. And then Jesus qualifies it by emphasizing, say, for everyone that asketh. So he doesn't even prescribe who it has to be, he said, anyone. If ev everyone that asketh receive it, and everyone that seeketh find it, and everyone that knocketh has the door open unto him. So when we go back to James, where we are now, in James 1 5, if any of you that will be everybody. Lacking wisdom, let that person ask of God. But see, that's also a very good lesson for all of us. And I've told people again and again and again. God requires that we come to Him for what we need. The idea that people these days have put so much of their lock, stock, and barrel in somebody who's a better prayer warrior to pray for them is not God's intention. That's good if you need that, but that's for babies. Sometimes God has additional instructions. When David was fighting those Philistines, with, yeah. when he prayed to Baal Perazim, the yeah. Lord, yeah. and he the first time said, "Lord, can I can I win this battle?" Yeah. The Lord said, "Yeah, go right in, do it." And so he went right in, did it, won the battle. And then uh, he had another time where he had to come up against them. And it says, then he asked the Lord. He said, "Can I take them?" And the Lord right, said, right. "No." Right, right. He right. said, "But if you go around their backside." Right. You can take them. And he did that and won. That's good. And, and Stephen, you're exactly right about that. And, and that helps me to explain further what he just said to us. Because what Stephen just told us there is exactly right. And that has to do when we're asking or praying about some things that we don't know what God's will is. You know, because David is asking. He don't know. I mean, is it God's will for us to go to this battle or not to this battle? When you're praying about something you do not know and you have no strict will of God in the Word of God, then you do want that guidance. You do want His wisdom on what you should do. But when we're praying about things that we know is His will, like healing, like protection, like salvation, all the things He said in His Word that already belongs to us, well, let me put it this way. The Scripture says, all the promises of God are yea and amen, which is yes and amen. All his promises already belong to you, so it's always going to be yes and amen. You don't have to say, Lord, if it be thy will, heal me. Because we already know he's already provided that. Is that what he has already his will. So, and so Stephen, I'm glad you brought that up because that helped differentiate that context. That when we're praying about something, David was doing that. Should we go to this battle? Should I push you after the people that push you after me? What is your will? And how should we do that? And guidance came and direction came on what God said yes or no or how should we should go about solving that. Okay? But when but he tells us here in James, so let's go back to James. He said if we lack in wisdom, so it's not about wisdom. He wants all of us to have wisdom. You know? And he said, let that person ask. I love that. Let that person ask. Let him ask. Okay, put your finger there and let's go to James 5. We're still in the same book. I'm not going to take you too far away. But look at James chapter 5. And I want to emphasize this one point. And look at verse 14. We were in James 1 and verse 5. We're going to go to James 5 and verse 14. And it says, well, let's just read that verse 13. We're going to read 13 and 14. Is any among you afflicted? Let him do what? Let him pray. Let him pray. I mean, James, same book, but we go to chapter 5. Uh, we're in verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? The word afflicted means tested, tried, troubled. Let him pray. Now notice he didn't say, is anybody afflicted? Call Alana to pray for you. Is any afflicted? Let me call Brandon to pray for me. No. Is any afflicted? Let that person pray. Is any married? Let that person sing songs. Very interesting. I mean, I don't want to go to church and say, well, I'm married. You sing for me and I'll listen. <laughs> it sounds silly, doesn't it? But isn't that amazing? You know, and it does sound silly. 
But how many times have we had people say to us, well, some people are anointed prayer warriors. So you got to ask them to do the praying for you because they're prayer warriors. There's no such scripture in the Bible. Yeah, I've heard that. It You've heard that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But it's a traditional statement. People make that. No, there's no scripture in the Bible that says somebody's a prayer warrior. And I understand what they're trying to say, that, that, which that, there's that, some that. truth to the fact that some people are very good at praying. That's true. Yeah. And they have, you know, an ability to have a lot of answers in prayer. But the reason they are is because they developed it. If the rest of us develop it, we'll be like them. Because the God did not intend for some people to be good prayers and others to not be good prayers. Because if that's the case, James, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, will not tell you if you're afflicted that you pray. He would have said, if you're afflicted, call Apostle Paul to pray for you. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that, did he? Or call a prayer warrior. He didn't say that. And so I say to people all the time, it's so important to note, because when it comes to prayer, when it comes to worship, and when it comes to our financial giving, God has put an individual personal responsibility on every one of us. It's good if we depend on somebody to help us sometimes. That's okay. But God, like any other father, wants to have a personal relationship with each of us. He doesn't want us to have surrogates that's coming on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It did, yeah. He's the with me for unbelief. Yeah. And I you, don't you have unbelief. You know what I done that? Uh -huh. My Lord and Savior. And, and man, I just want to do it. <laughs> you know what I did? Can I share this? Uh, well, well, maybe not right now, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. But but we, we appreciate that. You know, I used to be Catholic too. Yeah. So I'm not understanding you mean because in the Roman Catholic Church, we were caused to so be dependent on the priest to do what, do it all. Yes. In fact, we were told that we had no access to God. You let the priest, you won't do anything, have the priest to do it. But that takes the response from you being a personal child of God, isn't it? So let's look at our subject here. So he said, is any among you sick? I mean, uh, Mary? Let that person sing some. Now look at verse 14. Is any sick among you? James 5, 14. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. Now, we don't have to look at that. But I just wanted to bring that point that God is looking for a personal relationship with every one of us. Let's go to chapter 1 then of James 1. James chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God. The God that giveth to all men liberally. We always say generously. And it operates not. That means it's not stinky. It's not going to hold back. And notice what he says. And it shall be given to him. Shall be given to him. There's no question about it. If we know what God's will says we're asking based on what he said and promised that his spouse, he's going to give it. He's going to give it. That's what James is telling us. But now notice a little qualification there in verse 6, which is where we're going to. Let him ask in faith. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that waves is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So James is telling us that when we ask, Number one, we know that we'll receive, but we'll receive only if we ask in faith. So faith is a legal tender, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to ask of God, you better have some faith to receive. Now let's look at the next scripture about this. Let's go to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, right out of the mouth of the Lord. See what he says about faith in connection with petition or asking God for something. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And I know you guys know the scriptures, but it's good to kind of review it because it's a foundation. If we're going to understand what the DNA of faith is, if we're going to look at the skeletal structure of faith, the, what I call the building blocks of what makes up faith, it's good to know why faith is necessary. And that's what we're finding here. God says to James, if you need wisdom, ask of God. He's a generous God. He's going to give to you, but you got to ask in faith. Got to ask in faith. So he said that. Now we found Mark 11 and verse 24. Now know this. Therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire when you pray. So he's talking about things again that you want in your life. He said when you pray. Now notice he says believe that you receive them. 
believe that you receive them. It's the same thing as uh, that James said, you must ask in faith. You must ask in faith. Believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So in other words, if, if he had said, therefore, whatever things you desire, when you pray, you shall have them. Oh, we'll have it all made, won't it? <laughs> I mean, we'll have it all made. If he only said he just, just ask, and you're just going to get it, we'll have it all made. But he had to qualify that thing by saying, you got to believe that you received them. Now, this is so important, and I better stop here because this was not necessarily part of our subject, but it does have to explain faith a little bit better. Now, notice here, this is so, so important when it comes to faith. Notice what it says, whatsoever things you desire, Mark 11, 24, when you pray, not after you pray, not before you pray, he said, when you're praying about it, when you're praying about it, what is your responsibility? For you, the person praying about it, believe that you receive them. Now notice it didn't say believe that you will receive them. It, it, it sounds like there's not that much difference, but it's a little bit different there. It didn't say believe that you will receive them. It said believe that you receive them. In other words, believe that you have them already. Believe that you have them already. Believe that you receive them. That is the stance of faith. And I can't tell you how many times in my healing meetings, in my faith seminars, when I'm teaching people about faith, and I've heard them again and again, the people who ended up not receiving, I always try to pay attention to the words of their mouth. And nine times out of ten, I hear them say, well, brother, you prayed for me, and I believe one of these is I'm going to get it. See, that's not faith. See, they keep it in the future. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, believe that you receive them. He did say, believe that you will receive them. Another statement they also make is they say, well, I believe I'm going to get it. See, they use the word believe, but it's still a future tense. And anything that's future, which means you don't have them yet by your faith. And anything you don't have yet by your faith is not really believe, it's hope. So people many times will confess hope, thinking they're in faith. Every time the country make that statement, one day I'm going to get it. I believe that I'm going to get it. Well, why would you have to believe you're going to get it? You see? And why does God tell us to believe that we receive them? Because He's already provided them. That's the reason for Him to tell you to believe that you receive them. You know, Ephesians 1 3, don't have to look at every script, but in Ephesians 1 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now notice, he said God has blessed us with how many? All spiritual blessings. Where did he bless us with? In heavenly places. See, you see the reason why we need faith? It's in the realm of God. He blessed us in the realm of God and provided it there. It's like somebody puts money in $2 million. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. At First Bank in Manford. You know? <laughs> they put $2 million in Manford Bank for you. You can't sit at home and say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm getting my money right here sitting at home watching my TV. No, you got to go to the bank to get it. That's the way it is. And you know, I'm right there in Ephesians 1 3. It says, what well, all the things God has already blessed us with. Where did he keep them? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. And I said this years ago, why did he do that? He did that because he knew we have an enemy. He's keeping it for us and not keeping it from us. Are you with me? He's keeping it for us and not keeping it from us. If somebody put the money in first bank in Manfred for you, they're keeping it for you and not from you because they tell you how to go get it. But they're making sure that you're the only one that gets it and not somebody else gets access to it. Because John 10.10 10 tells us the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Boy, isn't that what he likes to do? He has nothing of his own. All he wants to do is go around trying to steal what somebody else belongs to. You know, I, there's a lady I was talking to the other day and she said, well, brother, pray, 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 pray. The devil is after me. I said, why are you afraid of the devil? The devil's up to me, and he's going to get me. He's going to get me. He's going to get me. I said, the devil's been defeated. Well, I know you said that. He's been defeated, but he's up to me. I can hear him threatening me. I said, well, that's all he's doing. The Bible says he's a roaring lion. 
He has been defined. When the Bible says he's defeated, the Bible doesn't mean he has been eliminated and eradicated. It just means that he's been rendered powerless. He's been defined. It's like a snake. Oh, Bob, that's my snake. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys know how much I love snakes. <laughs> yeah, <I'm old. laughs> funny, funny, funny. <laughs> it's that snake that they tell me all the time, Fidelis, it's not poisonous. Yeah, thank you very much. Anything that looks like a snake and moves like a snake, I don't want to be there. <laughs> you may tell me it's not poisonous, I don't want to find out. <laughs> but if it's not poisonous, it's not poisonous, isn't it? But there's somebody who doesn't know, like myself, you know, just see that thing slip around as black as it looks and it's six feet long. I'm going to say, well, oh, it's poisonous. You may tell me it's not, but I don't want to go by your research. I'm out of here. <laughs> and that's what this lady was doing. She's running away from a non-poisonous snake. The devil has been defined. He don't have his poison anymore. Because if you think how many times the devil tells us, I'm going to get you, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to get you, I'm going to kill you. That's what that roaring lion does, you know, I came from Africa. That lion roars to put fear in you so that you become paralyzed and give up all your defenses and you think that it's bigger than you so that you give in. And so the snake comes around and hisses and carries on but it's not poisonous. And if you know that, you're going to say, oh. You're just fooling around. I'm not afraid of you. And that's what that lady should have done, I believe. She should have said, well, the devil is screaming around me, but he must be making a lot of noise because he really has no power. He has been defanged. The devil could destroy this world and all the people in it. He would have already He would have already done it, that? Because that's his purpose anyway, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. You're exactly right there, brother. I mean, if he could have done it, he would have done it a lot already. And the reason he hasn't done it gives us some wisdom to understand we have power over it. We might as well believe what God said. So, Mark 11, 24. Therefore I sell to you the things you desire when you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now let me complete this part again. Now notice it says believe that you receive them. And I've had people that say, well you prayed for me, but I don't feel any different. Why do you say believe I receive them? Because I don't feel it. But see, what they are trying to say to you is, you prayed for me and I don't know it yet. But that's not what the Bible said. The Bible didn't say, believe that you know it. It said, believe that you receive it. Which means, you hold on to the belief that it's yours until it arrives. Until it arrives. God is saying, your stance is to keep declaring that you have them and my stance is to see to it that you have them. You notice the difference? Your stance, my stance when we believe and ask for something, I'm asking for these glasses because I don't have it. Let's assume I didn't have glasses. I'm asking for the glasses. Well, give me glasses. And God said, believe that you already received it. Okay. So I believe, Lord, that I have the glasses. Somebody asked me, do you have the glasses? No, I don't have it yet. It's in the whole realm. But I'm exercising my faith that it belongs to me because God's word says it belongs to me. And while I keep declaring that it is mine, notice what the Bible says here in the last phrase of that verse, and ye shall have them. Oh, that's a wonderful lesson about faith. Many times, and this has tripped many of us who have tried to walk in faith. Many times when we pray about something, from the moment we pray, I taught the subject one time from prayer to manifestation. From the moment we pray and we accept or believe or declare that we have them, that time frame may be different and longer between when you declare that you have them until when you actually have them. There may be, there's a time frame, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's immediate. I've seen that happen. I've had people come to a healing meeting, pray for them, and boom, they've got the healing right there. And that's a problem. Many people think, well, I've got to get it that way. But God didn't say you're going to get it that way. Because we see that Jesus prayed for some people, and they got it while they left. While they walked away, they received their healing. You know? There were some people that God, Jesus, even prayed for, 
And later on, the Bible says the very same hour that he prayed for them, they were in a different location, they were here. So they were even there. So we need to always recognize that it's our job to believe when we pray that we receive what God has already given to us. We believe with our faith, we grasp a hold of it in our hearts. See, with your faith, you grasp it. You can't see it, you don't feel it, but you grasp a hold of it and say, I have it. And the key, the key to knowing that you have actually taken a stand that you believe you received it, is what you do next. Are you going to start thanking God that is yours? Are you going to start thanking God that's yours? Because that's the key, that's the kicker to let God know, hey, Lord, I put it in your hand. I don't have to worry about how he's going to do it. When you start worrying about how he's going to do it, you'll mess around in God's part. God said, this is your part, this is my part. Your part is to believe that you receive them. My part is to see that you have them. So leave my part alone with me. Let me do what I know to do best. You remember the story of the fig tree? It's there in this same chapter of Mark 11. Jesus cursed the fig tree while they were going to Jerusalem. And the disciples and his apostles heard him say that. He said, this fig tree withered all the way from its root. And the Bible said nothing happened. And they left. When they came back the next day, the tree was withered from the roots. It's in the same chapter, you can read it later. And Peter was so shocked. And he alerted everybody. And the reason he did was because they all remember from the night before that when Jesus said unto the tree, nothing seemed to have happened. Nothing seemed to have happened. And Peter said, look, Lord, look, 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 look. The tree that you cursed yesterday is withered from the roots. You know, Peter started, I mean, he was just, just beside himself. And I know that part of the reason Peter was beside himself is that they all remembered when he called Lazarus on the grave and Lazarus came out right away. They remember when he cursed the storms to calm down, and the storms calmed down right away. They remember when he laid hands on the lepers, and the lepers were cleansed that right away. And here he cursed the fig tree, and it seems like nothing happened. It was the next day that they came and saw the effect of what Jesus' words had had on the tree. So that's a very good lesson for us when it comes to faith. I want you to really know that and keep that in your heart. If you really believe that God has given you the things in the word that he said he gave to you, healing, blessing, safety, provision, protection, then we need to start declaring after we've asked God that we have it. That doesn't mean we have it in reality. It just means that we believe that we have it. Let God work it out on high manifest. You mean let life. God do his job? Yeah, let God do his job. Isn't that wonderful? I think he's been dealing with me on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a lesson we all have to learn there, sister. I mean, yeah. letting God do his job. Because in this room, your symptoms is going to keep speaking to you. The attorneys are going to keep calling you. You still owe that money. You know, whatever it is you're believing in God. You know what I'm saying? You ask God, you believe God, that God's provided Oh, I've been there. I mean, I've been there. I remember when I had bursitis in my shoulders when I was pastoring years ago. And you know, when you're pastoring, you're, you know, you're number one example because everybody sees that. You're going to go on the platform and they see you're hurting. And I, I asked the Lord, say, Lord, you know, this bursitis in my shoulders, I can't hardly leave my house, but I'm going to go and preach, man. This is Wednesday afternoon. I'm preaching tonight. Sunday I'm going to preach. I mean, I'm hurting. I'm in pain. And the Lord said, declare your faith. That you the healed of the Lord. I said, good. So I just got on my knees in my home there in Tahlequah. And I said, Lord, thank you. That Matthew 8, 17 says, Jesus already took all my infirmities. And Matthew 8, 17 says, Jesus already took all my sicknesses. You know that past tense? Matthew 8, 17. Jesus took my infirmities. He carried away all my sicknesses. And the reason the Bible says that is because that happened on the cross. That's when he carried it. That's when I was healed 2,000 years ago. I receive it now. I was healed 2,000 years ago. I receive it now. I was blessed 2,000 years ago. I receive that blessing now. You see what? See what it is? So I declared it. I got off my knees and my shoulders were still hurting. But I knew enough of the word, thank God, to know that I can't be going by the symptoms. Because if I was going by the symptoms, I could have immediately declared, well, I asked God, and he said no. 
Mm. See, that's what I would have done, but I, I'm glad I didn't do that. I got off of my knees and started thanking God. I couldn't believe my you know, hands off, so you know, I'm still hurting. I said, Lord, I thank you that I received healing for those bursitis of my shoulders. Isn't it wonderful that 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross and carried away my sickness and diseases, and by faith, I receive it now. Like you said in Mark 11, 24. By faith, I receive it now. Thank you for it. Hallelujah. Amen. Went to my service. Ministered to people at the church. You know, ministered to people who were sick. They were getting healed. My shoulders were still hurting. The next morning when I had my devotion, that was the first thing I wanted to address. The shoulders are still hurting. The next morning. And I went back on my knees and said, Lord, I'm going to have my devotion right now. But I want to thank you that 2,000 years ago I was healed of bursitis. Because you said you carried away my sicknesses. According to Matthew 8, 17. And yesterday, hallelujah, I received my healing. And I want to thank you that I received it yesterday. And then the next day, on Friday, I did the same thing. Lord, thank you that two days ago, two days ago, I received healing for bursitis. Hallelujah. What a wonderful truth to know that. And then Friday, I did the same thing. Saturday, I did the same Did you know I did that for 11 days? And on the 11th day, boom, all the symptoms disappeared. Mm -hmm. I was able to lift up my hands. See, the devil will test you. Mm -hmm. And he'll bring false lying symptoms to you. Doctors will give you uh, their reports. I mean, you know, it's like what we said about Linda, you know, Linda Mercer. Mm -hmm. God heal you, man. Yes, yes. But how long she was going through that? She had treatment and different things. Yeah. But she stood her ground, said, I received already. Yeah. And kept thanking God. Somebody said, well, how long do I have to do that? What does it matter? As long so as say, it takes. As long as it takes. Thank you very much. I love that. <laughs> as long as you take. It's amazing. It's amazing that we go to doctors. This is really a good lesson. We go to doctors and we all have. I've been there. We go to doctors and they'll, you know, I've, I've seen Christians are the, the best at believing in, in pills and medication. They really are. And the doctor says, take these three pills, three times a day, for 50 years. Or something that they don't even give you the time for it. They just say, you're going to take the rest of your life. We start taking pills. Mm -hmm. We don't tell the doctor, you guarantee me I'm going to get healed. I'm not going to be drinking all these pills. Especially as large as they are. You thank God until you get your healing. Yes. Because that's how faith works. That's how faith you works. You thank God after you get your healing because that's how gratitude works. <laughs> wow, I like that. Isn't that a good word? Yeah, that's how gratitude. I like, I'm going to steal that. I and don't. not give you any credit. You'll get it. <laughs> so isn't that wonderful? But anyway, we see here now in Mark 11, 24, that faith is required because it says, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. So belief of faith is the legal tender to get what we ask God for. And belief just means accepting and concluding and declaring that I have what I've already asked for. I've got to declare that I have it. I don't have to keep saying I want to get it. I don't have to keep saying I'm going to get it. All that is hope. That's not faith. You got to come to the point where you accept it and say, okay, Lord, I thank you that I have it. You say, do you have it? No, not yet. But I'm thanking God that I have it. Well, do you feel any different? Not yet. But I'm not speaking my feelings. I'm speaking my faith. Isn't that what happened to Abraham? You know, the Bible tells us in Abraham, Romans chapter 4, such a wonderful, perfect example about faith. God told him that the son is going to come off of your loins between you and Sarah. And Abraham, begin that day, began to keep declaring that he had it. Because God changed his name to Abraham. And the word Abraham means father of many nations. Now you talk about somebody who's nearly 100 years old. And starts going around telling everybody, I'm father of many nations. When no evidence is showing in his body or in Sarah's body. In fact, all the evidence showed that they're older and they couldn't get that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, but, but yet the baby showed up in them. Yeah, well, that's like you said, there's no evidence. Faith is the substance of things hopeful. Yes, evidence. the evidence. The faith is the evidence, isn't that right? I like, like that. Thank you there, brother. The faith is your evidence till the reality of the other evidence is shown. So I hold on to my faith and keep declaring it because I trust my father. Isn't that correct? Now let's go to our notes. 
So in our notes, we said last week and began with number one that they are, this is an ever constant standard. Number one uh, statement in our notes is an ever constant stand. In other words, number one, trusting in God is something we're going to begin with and always be in that place. There's not going to be any time we're going to say, well, I quit trusting God, or I trusted God and I'm taking a break. If you trust God, then you've got to keep trusting God. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. And the word trust means to rely, to lean on, to depend on. You know, it's sort of similar to faith, but it's not exactly the same. And we read that in Proverbs 3, 5. We looked at that last week. Where it said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, I'm going to interject this here because it's so important. And you're going to hear me say this again and again and again as we go to the study. The whole thing about faith is based on relationship. Faith is based on relationship. Because if some guy, I don't care how slick they are, comes off the street, all right, and walks out of a Rolls Royce, the guy that I've never met and said, Fidelis, I just put $2 million in first bank in Manfred for you. What is the likelihood that I believe that guy? Hmm. Not very much. I don't know him. I mean, he may be walking out of a Rolls Royce. It may be true, but I don't know. The chances that I can put up my whole life on the side and say I believe him is next to nil. Isn't that correct? It's next to nil that I will believe him. Yeah, come on in. Just we can have a seat. I'll give you the notes okay. that we studied from. Pass it on to her. There, Alana. Okay. Yes, you're welcome. You. So, faith is based on a relationship. The relationship we have with a God that is loving, that we know we can trust His word. Because if you can't trust His word because you don't know Him, how are you going to have faith in Him? Mm -hmm. And that's why I say to people, God never judges you based on how much you know. He judges you based on what you know with what you're doing with what you know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so God never judges us based on what we don't know or what we know. He judges us based on what we know on what we're doing with what we know. In other words, with every light that we have, He has a responsibility for us to respond to that light, that revelation, that knowledge of Him. If we have knowledge of Him and we despise it or ignore it or refuse to believe Him, that's what really gets Him. You know, that's what happened to the children of Israel. Isn't that right? I mean, He displayed Himself with all this great power through Moses and Aaron in delivering them from the hand of, of Pharaoh. Isn't that correct? Brought them through the middle of the Red Sea. They walked on dry ground with the walls of water congealed beside them. I mean, you talk about that kind of display. Then they come to the wilderness and they said to God, Well, we're not sure you're going to bring us to the promised land. You brought us to this wilderness to kill us. See, that's where God got upset, remember? Because God is saying, Wait a minute, I, I missed something. Something wrong with this picture. God is saying, How could I have done all those miracles, supernatural, tremendous miracles, in bringing you, I forget them, about 10 or 12, there were many of them. And then you come to the wilderness, some you start doubting me, you got to be kidding me. So you don't really know me. You don't really believe in me. You don't really give me the respect that I'm your true father. That will complete what I said I was going to complete. I've shown you evidence that I'm with you and for you. Why would I bring you to the wilderness to kill you? What does God get out of it? We never usually ask ourselves that question sometimes because we're so selfish people. We're always thinking about me, myself, and I, and what I want, and if I don't get it, we get upset at everybody and blame everybody, you know. It's like my friend I told you about the other day. Five divorces, and she's wanted to go to number six marriage. And I said, sister, maybe we ought to slow down here. Maybe we ought to date this guy for a year to make sure that we're doing the right thing, and he's doing the right thing. Oh no, pastor, she said. I don't need to do that. This man is my soulmate. And I said to my sister, I said, listen, I'm not going to do that wedding. Because the other five people were your soulmates. Now we got number six soulmates. You remarried the same man that many times. 
No, she's married five other men. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And that's an experience, not an opinion. <laughs> so I she had me deep. But yeah, but so she was and she, she she hastened to tell me that it was all these other men's problems. Um, the five men that I had that didn't work out, I was well meaning, I was perfect and everything was okay. <laughs> it's their problem. And I said, Sister, I I don't think so. It takes two to tango. If you were ever in a marriage, there's some part you contributed that caused a failure of that marriage. And if you fail five times, it might be a good idea to take it a little slow, figure out where I had my own failures, probably not all yours, and say, I'm gonna fix all that before I go to number six. Wouldn't that make sense? Yeah, be accountable. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I was trying to tell. I said, and the reason I gave you a whole year, even though you're 50 years old, the reason I gave you a whole year is because I'm not so sure you know what you're doing. I'm not so sure I know that you know what you're doing. I'm not so sure the guy you met now that is your soulmate or forever knows what he's doing. The one year will help us figure that out. Mm -hmm. That we're in the right place. And this is the golden, the one. Why don't we wait and do that? Oh no, she was not going to wait. Pastor, I was a perfect wife. She almost said that. She didn't really say that, but she just said, I had no problem. I was always a loving person. Yeah, really. <laughs> Even if she was perfect, then the one thing that she fails to realize is that, she's not perfect. Is that she made five bad choices. Choices, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's bare minimum. She didn't want to accept that, did she? Yeah. bad choices. And that's not including dating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So the, the conclusion of the story was I decided I was I couldn't wait then unless you're going to come for counseling. I'm going to. I said even I I may be willing to bring it down to six months, but you know, but I want to see this guy. I want to see both of you in my office every week. We're going to talk about it. We're going to look at the scriptures. We're going to pray about it. If he, you know, my pastor said years ago, if it's God today, it's going to be God tomorrow. What, what's the rush? What is the hurry here? You've already had five mess ups. I don't want to be in that much in a hurry. That's why I've been alone eleven years. <laughs> so, it's, it's, never mind. Yeah, never mind. I'm we're not going to have your video. I'm a little thing, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> the conclusion is I did not do the wedding. They went over to the next state and had their wedding in a month. <laughs> And then they were divorced in one year. Yeah. It was the worst divorce she ever had. I mean, it was terrible. It was bad. I mean, six it was sad. bad choices. Yeah, six bad <laughs> choices. And it was really bad. It was painful for us as a church. It was painful for her as a person. It was painful because we love her and, and who she is and all that. But anyway, we need to realize that. So it's important to know that trusting God first, which is what we're looking in our notes here, trusting God first, it's a good thing to know. Proverbs 3, 5, trust God with all your heart. How are you going to trust God with all your heart? It doesn't come by willpower. It comes by familiarizing yourself with the words of God. If you read the words of God enough every day, and you hear him telling you how much he loves you, how much he's provided for you, how much he's going to stand for you, how much he's going to fight for you, at some point you're going to say, I trust this God, man. I trust him. Because I know what his word says. But if you don't know what his word says, like the slick guy who came in with his Rolls Royce and said, I've got two million dollars waiting for you, Fidelis, in First Bank in Manford. Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm immediately going to think, maybe that guy is one of these uh, flakes. One of these flakes. So, so there's, there's something behind it. What is in it for you? People don't just go around giving you two million dollars. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Out of the goodness of their heart. Of people they don't know, especially when I'm not one of your kids. So there you have it. Now let's look at Hebrews 11.6. We didn't have time to look at that, but you need New Testament. Let's go to Hebrews 11.6. And we're talk, talk, talking about trusting God. We're talking about relying on God. We're talking about building a relationship with God. And remember what I said to you, and I want you to remember this, because you're going to say, well, but I don't have that much of a strong relationship with God at this point. It doesn't matter. Thank God you. is only always going to measure you about what it is you know in relationship to what you're doing with it. He's not going to measure about what you don't know. He, he, he has to be an unjust God, an unholy God, to ask you to behave in something that you don't know. He's not going to do that. God doesn't ever do that. He's only going to require something of you that he knows you can provide and you can produce. 
So in Hebrews 11, notice in Hebrews 11, another thing about this Hebrews 11 is you read the whole chapter, you see that he keeps talking about every one of these people receive things from God by faith. So that also establishes that faith is a legal tender in the spirit realm to get things. Because in verse 3 of Hebrews 11, it says, through faith. Verse 4, it says, by faith, Abel. Verse 5, it says, by faith, Enoch. You see that? By verse 7, it says, by faith, Noah. Verse 8, it says, by faith, Abraham. Verse 9, by faith, he sojourned. That's Abraham did. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah. And so we go on again and again and again and again. Verse 17 says, by faith, Abraham. Every one of them only received from God because they did it through faith. They didn't get it from God because they were just wonderful people. They didn't get it from God because they were pretty. They didn't get it from God because they did a lot of sacrifices. They didn't get it from God because they went to church every day. They got it from God because they believed God. They trusted God. They exercised their faith in a faith God. All right? Now let's go to Hebrews and verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, I told you faith is necessary in the spiritual realm, just like money is necessary in this realm. With money in my pocket, I can purchase products and goods. With money not in my pocket, I cannot purchase products and goods. Are you with me? In this realm, money is a legal tender. In the spirit realm, which is where we want to get our gifts from, we want to get the thing God has provided for us that He kept for us, not from us, we got to use faith to exchange to receive it. So He said, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. The Him there is God. For he that comes to God, now notice, must believe. Must believe. And it tells you what you're going to believe. It didn't say you must believe everything about God. It just tells you some very basic thing he wants you to believe. Believe that God is. Believe that God is alive. God, God is. He exists. And he is who he says he is. Believe that God is. Believe that God is. So everybody, I've said that to atheists every time. We they say, well... Well, I don't know that there's God, and I don't know that I can believe it. Well, he tells you, believe that he is. Believe that he is. And remember, we looked at this, I think it was a couple of weeks ago in our class, that the reason God said, believe that he is, is based on Romans 1, and based on some other scriptures that says that God, through the creation we see all around us, has already declared that he exists. He said, you see all my creation, that declares me. So you have, no, you have no excuse not to believe me. See, that's what he said. Now notice, so he said, believe that God is, what is the second thing he wants to say? Only two things he wants us to believe. And believe that he is a rewarder. Now who is he going to reward? Only a special group of people. The people that diligently seek him. He rewards only those who diligently seek him. He doesn't re re reward the casual observer. He doesn't really want the people who said the little dab will do. I'm just going to try God, see if it works. You don't reward those people. He doesn't reward the people who are going to say, well, sometimes I'm going to follow God, other times, you know, you know, like a friend of mine said years ago, well, you know, God did not expect us to be so religious. You know, she said, God did not expect us to be. I don't know why they say those things and they can't even give you a scripture for it. Well, God did not expect us to be so religious. I just can't go church, church every week. It's just too much with you. She was saying this to me. It's just too much with you. Church, church, every week, church. And I said to her, well, you go shopping every week if I know you well. Do you have a scripture for that? I go shopping. I mean, did I go to shop? I mean, she, she believed in I mean, I've never seen anybody, you know, women. Women usually generally like shopping. I like shopping, I do. I'm, you know, I've got to be a woman. I really like a lot of shopping. If I have the money for it. <laughs> so if I don't have the money, I don't even try. But I've never seen anybody who loves shopping like this woman I'm talking about. She believes, she actually believes that every single sale that's out there had her name in it. <laughs> I mean, they had a midweek sale. Oh, Fidel's, we got to go to that one. And then they had a weekend sale. Paul, oh, we got to go to that. We can't miss out on you. You never know what you're going to get out of that sale. Mm -hmm. 
They had a pre-Labor Day sale. They had the middle of the Labor Day sale. Mm -hmm. They had the half the day books. She was in every one of them. I said, you don't have enough money to buy it all. They set up those sales to get you. You're the perfect taxi for yeah, sales. Yeah, stay yeah. away from Marketing. sales. Yeah. I just stay at my home. I don't even want to commercials. I don't want to put sales. But she want to keep track of every commercial. And she wanted everything that's on the sale. I'm going to save two cents. I'm going. Yeah, two cents. Thank you very much. So God wants us to diligently seek Him. And I told my friend, I said, I noticed that because I diligently seek God, every single time I was attacked in my body, I got healed. It didn't always happen at, at the first day. Like I, you know, you guys heard my testimony. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had diabetes. It took me eleven years. It took me eleven years to get rid of it. Eleven years from when I started praying about it. I was in the doctor's office, in 1994, when the doctor discovered it. He said, "Fidelis, I'm sorry to tell you, you must have a very difficult marriage because your body is under so much stress." And now you become type 2 diabetic. And he proceeded to inform me the wonderful news that this attacks most African Americans. Most black people have diabetes. See, that's supposed to console me. <laughs> the doctor is telling me this at the oh, yeah. OU Medical it's Center. Tricky one. Said most black people, we don't know why, and that's the reason they're practicing. We don't know why, but most black people have diabetes. Black people get it. Yeah? Black people get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, 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 that, well, that's, what, that's what I got. They said, black man. Is that something? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm yeah, sitting there going. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't look black. You're a pretty big old white. I mean, that's what they, I mean. No, that, that that's just something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but isn't yeah. that, that not help us to know that, boy, I'm glad I, I, I believe in a God that knows everything rather than the doctrine that knows so much. They may not really know everything. I can't put all my life in their hands, you know. They sometimes have been very helpful. I mean, I've had treatments, but I never, I, you know, I've had people, one lady called on the phone, I think it was last week, and said, Brother, I want you to pray for me because I think the Lord is mad at me. I said, well, What is it mad at you about? Well, I had some treatments concerning my eyes, and I had surgery, and I don't think God wanted me to have any surgery. I should have just believed God only. I said, Did you think that the surgery and the medical treatment came from the devil? Well, I don't know, but I shouldn't have believed in that. I said, all, the Bible says all good things come from God. Mm -hmm. James chapter 1. All good things come from God. I'll take everything that's good. The devil has never created any healing for anybody. God provided medical science as his mercy to humanity because not everybody's going to have all this faith. Thank you. So I said, I've been there when I needed a surgery. Boy, bring the surgery. I'm not going to deny the surgery. But it doesn't keep you from believing God at the same time. You're getting two streams of God's healing. Natural, spiritual. I'm going to take it all. I'm not going to deny myself the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of getting a blessing. You know? And I, I told him, I said, why, would, why do you want to? You're letting the devil de defeat you. Because the devil is the one deceiving her. Trying to put her in a place where she's going to extend faith where she doesn't have it yet. Well, you must. In fact, I've seen more Christians that God's going to keep you in that place where you're getting treatment. While you're getting treatment, you believe God for something bigger. And if you're in a place where there's no treatment available, believe God anyway. Mm -hmm. And he, he'll come he, through for you. He didn't design us to suffer. No, he didn't design us. So all good things come from God. So God rewards them who diligently seek him. Who diligently seek him. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're out of time again, aren't we? But our God is a good God, isn't he? You are going to say something? Yes, about my wife. She had, uh, we had faith and praying for it, for her to get, she had gold, stone, uh, gold stones. Uh -huh. And uh, she had to have surgery. And uh, we were praying in the church, praying, praying, praying. And uh, she had a Jewish doctor that didn't have much faith. He was a non-Messianic, just a Jewish doctor. Yeah, man. yeah. And so he yeah. just, what he saw, you know, that's it. So... He said, you got a golf ball in there. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you saw it. And so we were praying real hard on it. And then she had the laparoscopic surgery. Yes. And then I specifically ran after them and said, I want you to get everything, you know, out of there. That, in the surgery. You know, I yeah, want right, to see that right. golf ball. You know? Right, right. And so they, they brought me it and said, here it is. This is her, you know, golf ball. And I go, gee, there's only little tiny, bevel, tiny things in there. 
Yeah. You know, like, where's the golf ball? And so she just said, well, that's what there was, you know. <laughs> Dr. Wolf wow. comes in, you know, and says, hi, you know, how, how was the surgery and how you feel, you know. And they go, I said, I thought you said that it was a golf ball that was in there. Yeah. And then, then I, I said, here's what came out. There's no golf ball. Yeah, it's not in there. Be a golf you know, prayer, right? So, yeah. so the, the doctor went, oh my God. He went, she's going to get yellow jaundice. I got to look where that golf ball is. It's running around. <laughs> this guy was going nuts. He's thinking, this is really bad, you know, running around. And the Lord spoke to my wife and said, this miracle wasn't so much for you, but it was for Dr. Wolf, for his eyes, that he would see this miracle. Wow, wow. Isn't that something? Yeah, isn't that something? That's a wonderful testimony. Alana, could you help me to bring the offering bucket from back here? I forgot to bring it earlier. But that's a wonderful testimony there, brother. Thank God for that. But did you guys get out of that? Does anybody have any questions? We're going to close you in a moment. We're going to take an offering. And if you need any prayer, don't have to have you on the video. We'll pray with you before we leave. But um, but we will go ahead and pray our final prayer tonight and close our session because it's just a one-hour session. And uh, I want you to just, you have those sheets. We're going to just keep on on this sheet till we finish up every concept in there. We're studying the diagnosis of faith, the DNA of faith. You have to take faith apart. What is the skeletal structure, the template, the framework on which faith has been built? Okay? So that's what we're looking at. All the, the five major parts that make up what faith is. Five major parts. Number one, trusting in God first. Number two, believing God's word. And this is in the input state, believing God's word. How you hear God's word and take it in. The Bible talks about faith comes by here. You gotta get in the word of God in you first. And then number three, meditating on God's word. So it's not just enough to just take in the word, it's enough to make sure that word is securely planted in your heart and nourished and watered, just like any seed you put in the ground. It's gotta be watered. It's gotta be, you gotta keep it in there from being stolen by the enemy. And it's through meditation we do that. That's also the input state. And then we go into the output state, which is number four, releasing God's word. After you get the faith, you got to figure out how to release it. Just like after you get the money, you got to figure out how to give it out to get services for it. So we'll get to that. And then the final stage of the output stage, so the two stages in the input, two stages in the output, final stage is thanking God for the answer. And this is one area that a lot of people miss it. You know, the Bible is very specific about that. If you go to many scriptures about faith and prayer, it's constantly saying with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. Because there's nothing like thanksgiving to assure God, I know that I got it. And I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I'm worshiping you. I know I received it in my, my reason to figure out to you that I receive it is that I'm thankful. Amen? All right, then. Praise God. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much tonight for your goodness and your grace and your love. We thank you for the word of God that we've received tonight. Help us to continue to stay grounded in it and growing in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Turn it off. All right, thank you. <laughs>